Exodus chapter 12, Exodus 12, we're going to preach through a few 13, 14 verses this morning. Happy Easter, but you know there'd be no Easter if it hadn't been for Good Friday, and Good Friday wouldn't be good if it wasn't for Easter, and by Easter, of course, I'm not talking about that ancient feast of Ishtar way back there, I'm talking about the day that our Lord rose upon. Amen. That's what Christians mean when they say Easter. But our Easter story has very deep roots in Passover. And as Paul told us, the Old Testament is our schoolmaster to teach us spiritual truths about the, the New Testament age that, that we live in. So we go back and look at it, and it helps us understand things that we see in the New Testament sometimes. It's literal happenings of the Old, the Old Testament, historical facts that teach Deep spiritual truths, which is why it's recorded in the Bible. God was trying to, for us, for our sake, we look back and see things that happened under Moses and we see how the Holy Spirit's teaching us about this dispensation we live in too. There's spiritual truths going on. Let's, let's start with verse 1 here in chapter 12. The Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, there wasn't just one of them, he used Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, and that's what the Lord said to him. Now, first of all, I want to read verse 1 because it says, hey, this Passover thing, this was God's idea. Man didn't invent it and say, here's what we'll do. God spoke to the leaders and the leaders shared it to the people. Verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It's springtime for, for the Israelites. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. And as Passover, as I already said, it's going to meld into Easter before eyes. I think it's just great that Easter occurs in the spring, especially when you live in East Tennessee in this time of the country, this part of the country, this time of the world, uh, everywhere, this part of the world, everywhere you go, coming to church this morning, stepping outside the sanctuary, the whole creation is proclaiming life from the dead. We see the, the flowers blooming, the grass greening, the birds singing, and we see the, the trees starting to burst out into life after it looked like they were dead all year. Now the difference was Jesus really was dead. And they weren't, but they're still proclaiming the life from the dead story to us. So, verse 3, God said to them, Speak you to all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day, now highlight that. If you don't do it in your Bible, do it in your mind. Just remember the tenth day. We'll to hold that thought for a little bit. In the tenth day of the month, you'll take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Every household is going to get their own lamb and bring it in here. We're going to, this is the first Passover. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to the house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall he make his count for the lamb. Now, first of all, I'll just ask you a question. You all New Testament Christians. Is the lamb in your house? Now, I'm not talking about your church house, neither. Is the lamb in your home? Is the lamb, is the Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, in your house? And verse 4 tells us, guess what? Every, they had, every house had to do it because everybody had to do their own eating, didn't they? Nobody else could eat the lamb for you. You had to eat the lamb yourself. Nobody else can trust Jesus on your behalf. You've got to feast on the lamb yourself. Have you received Christ? Are you feasting on the Lord? Verse 5. Your lamb will be without blemish, spotless. A male of the first year. Go out and get one out of the flock. It's got to be perfect. A male in the prime of its life and without blemish. Perfection, ain't it? And you'll take it from, from the sheep or from the, gate, from the goats. Now, what does that tell us about Jesus? We already know he was the only perfect man. The only perfect human being, a male in the prime of his life, without spot and without blemish, and the fact that he never sinned. But he came from among us. Take it from among the sheep and the goats. God became one of us. He became a human being in Jesus Christ. He came from among us. Verse 6. And you'll keep it to the 14th day. Now, you know I'm not good at math, but I told you, remember that 10 few verses ago. You put it up on the 10th day of the month and you keep it to the 14th day of the month of the same month. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel, they're going to kill it when the evening gets here. 
Now, I can do a couple of things with that. First of all, that's four days, ain't it? You know, Jesus came into Jerusalem for the last time on that Palm Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, in the evening, they came and arrested him and took him off to the kangaroo court of a trial and put him to death. Now, I can also do something else with it. Maybe this is what the Holy Spirit means by that. I wondered that. You know, you ever read things in the Bible say, you know, I know God said that, but why did God say that? It's all right to do that, by the way. That's called study. It's called theology. It's trying to understand your Bible. Why did God say to go out there in the flock on the 10th day and get a lamb, and you put it up to the 14th day, and then you kill it? It's one thing to go out to the pen and get a lamb and slaughter it right then and have a big feast. What happens when you bring it back on the 10th day and you keep it four days there at the house and then you kill it? You've got attached to it then, ain't you? It's almost like it's become a pet by then, ain't it? Maybe this is just one of those little glimmers in the Bible that God says, I want you to understand the pain that God felt when his son was slaughtered on Calvary's cross. And a little bit, we can say a little bit of how Christians feel about the pain that we feel when we remember that Jesus was slaughtered, crucified for, for you and I. Four days, kill it in the evening, verse 7. And they'll take of the blood. Other places, there's a little more detail. God said you, when you kill it, you cut it and you, you drain the blood out and you catch it in a bowl, in a basin. And then you take that bowl of blood, you, you take of the blood, and you strike it on the two side posts, the door post would say, and the upper door post of the house wherein they're going to eat it at. Now, first of all, that is an act of faith. They didn't save themselves by doing anything. The judgment was going to come, but God says, I'll provide a way out. But God did everything. They couldn't save themselves from the destroying angel that was about to come. But God says, I want you to do something. It don't have to do with saving yourself, but it means that, hey, I believe God. God said judgment's coming, and I'm going to believe God's word. And God says, I'm going to take that blood, and I'm going to pour it upon the doorpost of my house. And some little old Israelite boy probably said, Daddy, why are you doing that for and he said, you know, I don't really understand it. All I know is that God said to and we're going to do it, son. <laughs> I'm going to take that blood and I'm going to put it around the doorpost. And because God says when the destroying angel, when the judgment comes, that we'll be spared if we do what God said, apply the blood. Amen. A substitute had died for them, but it involved that blood that they wouldn't get caught up in the judgment. You know where this is going, don't you? Verse 8. And they'll eat of the flesh that night, roast it with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Uh, you know, Jesus said over in the Gospels, said, except you eat my flesh, and he wasn't talking about cannibalism. They understood he was speaking in a spiritual way. John the Baptist doesn't say he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Then Jesus told his believers, said, except you eat of my flesh. That means we receive Christ in a spiritual way. Uh, we're taking the physical stuff of the Old Testament and we're applying it to a, spi a spiritual thing in the New Testament. And he was roasted with fire. What was Jesus roasted with fire? Fire in the Bible is always a symbol of the judgment of God, ain't it? The lamb was roasted with fire. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross bearing your sins, he suffered the judgment of God, is what that is. For you and I, so that we could live. <laughs> Verse 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water. Don't boil it in water, don't eat it raw. Roast it with fire. His head with his legs and with the pertinence there, all of it, that you're going to eat, roast it with fire. Verse 10. And let nothing of it remain till the morning. Eat it all that one event there, that which remains of it until the morning you'll, you'll get rid of it. You'll burn that with fire. Well, I don't know what to do with this except this. I, I know one thing. I don't, I don't know of a human being. There probably ain't a human being if they lived more than a second after they got sa saved that didn't sin again sometime. And we have to confess and we have to repent. But we just received Christ one time. We don't have to get saved today and saved tomorrow and saved tomorrow. We can keep coming back to him and confessing our sins, but you know what? We're saved to the uttermost and we're saved eternally. 
But that is good news, ain't it? Verse 11. And, and God says, here's how you eat it. We ought to do it in the King James first. Thus shall you eat it. Now I'll give you the Appalachian version. Here's how you eat it. <laughs> King James, and thus shall you eat it. Eat it like this, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you eat it in a hurry, eat it in haste. Now we're going back to Egypt. Remember, God says, all God's saying to them says, you be ready to go. You, you, eat, you receive Christ and you be ready to go at any time. Jesus told a lot of parables in the New Testament. We call them the be ready parables. You don't know when the master of the house is coming. You know, I'll always be ready. To, we sing a song, be ready to go. <laughs> when, when you get saved, and be ready to go. And if you're not saved, you need to be ready to go. And that means you need to get saved, don't you? He didn't hurry and you have your loins girt and your staff in your hand. Be ready to go. Not just go to heaven either, but be ready to respond to whatever the Lord tells us to do in a hurry, right? Verse 12. For I'll pass through the land of Egypt this night. God says this now. This is God's judgment. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. All the firstborn was going to die, man, beast, Egyptians, and Israelites, except for that one caveat, the ones that applied the blood around the doorpost of their house. And he said, when I say the blood, I'll pass over you. That's how the Amen. Passover got its name. Boy, you can put that right out of Exodus 12, right over here anywhere in the Gospels or the book of Acts or the epistles or anything else. Say that judgment's coming. And the only way to escape the judgment is have you applied by grace through faith the blood of the Lamb around the doorpost of your heart. And then when we're standing there in the judgment, God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Because I recognize that you're one who Christ died for and you trusted in him. 13 and 14, we'll finish up our, our text here. And, and the blood shall be to you for a token, a sign. It'll be a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And the plague will not be upon you to destroy you. The judgment won't affect you when I smite the land of Egypt. What put that blood on the doorpost? Well, he said, a hyssop branch. But I propose to you also faith in what God had told them, put it there. What puts the blood on your heart? You believe the word of God. You say, I trust that Christ died for me. And that's applying the blood to the doorpost of your heart. And God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And this day will be unto you for a memorial. We have a day called Memorial Day when we remember the veterans that have died for us. Memorial has something to do, root word, I guess, be memory, wouldn't it? When we memorialize somebody, we remember them. And he said, this day will be a, a memorial for you and you'll keep it a feast to your Lord, to the Lord throughout your generations. You'll keep it a feast and an ordinance forever. Well, you know what? I believe that every Christian has a Memorial Day. First of all, we remember that day that Christ died for us on Calvary. When Jesus met with the disciples in the upper room to celebrate the last Passover that really counted, it became the Lord's Supper when he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. This is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in memory of me. So we remember what Christ did for us on Calvary, but I believe that every Christian has another Memorial Day too. I remember the day when the Lord saved me. Amen. Amen. I remember the day when by grace through faith I applied the blood to the doorpost of my heart. Now, let me close with this. A couple of different stories in the Old Testament here since we're in the Old Testament this morning. I was thinking about the Feast of the First Fruits. Now, the Passover was in the spring, but when the harvest came in later, God gave them specific holy days in Leviticus 23, and one of them was called the Feast of the First Fruits. And what it was, it was a harvest feast when the, God said very specifically, said, before you bring in the harvest, said, I want you to go out there and get a, a represent a sample and bring that sample back in. 
and bring that sample in the, and the priest it said on the morrow after the Sabbath they'll wave it before the Lord and the Lord said when I when I see that that first fruits the first fruits that you brought in he says I can declare the whole field holy out there they didn't have to gather the whole field and bring it in and show it to the Lord. He says, I'll let the first fruits represent all the rest of them. Now, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ is our first fruits. Christ is the one who represents all the rest of us in the harvest. It's not that God has to examine all of us, he examines Christ. And he said, Christ represents all those that have trusted in Christ. And because Christ is holy, therefore you're holy also. Now, the exciting thing into that scripture that I caught one time long ago as a young Christian, I thought, that's pretty cool. In the King James English, it says, uh, whenever you're going to bring it in, now you wait till Saturday. Saturday's a Sabbath. But on the morrow, on the morning after the Sabbath, you bring it in and wave it before us. That would be Sunday, wouldn't it? Because uh, in the Hebrews, Sabbath was Saturday. So on Sunday morning, they'll wave it before me. What happened on Sunday morning? Oh, that's when the Lord came out of the tomb, wasn't it? Amen. And he waved his life that he had lived before the Father and the Lord. And the Father said, because he's holy, all those followers of his are declared holy also. I don't have to go out in the field and look at them because he represents every one of them. And by the way, that's why we meet on Sunday. I didn't say that. The church fathers in the first century, I've got writings of them that said that we began to meet on Sunday in honor of the day that our Lord rose upon. It took about 17, 1800 years before there's a group of Christians said, let's go back to the Old Testament Sabbath and tell everybody else they're wrong. I don't care what day you worship on, that just bothers me when you go back to Saturday and you tell me that I'm wrong on Sunday, amen? I'm going to stick with what the church has done for over 2,000 years now. We're going to honor the day that our Lord rose upon because the old Sabbath was about the old creation and the new Sabbath is about the new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. <laughs> you can worship when you want. Just don't tell me I'm wrong. You just do what you want. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think the Lord's all that upset if you want to worship on Saturday anyway. It gets back to them things I said to somebody this week. I said, you know what? People get all hung up and they gag on gnats and swallow camels. You know where I got that saying? I got that from Jesus. We get all caught up in the little bitty details and we get all bent out of shape while we're going around swallowing camels, ain't we? Got the big sin in our life, but we worry about the little sins, right? Somebody doing something over there that ain't right. Meanwhile, you ain't seeing all the stuff that that thumb's pointing back at you while you're pointing over here somewhere, Amen. And then the other Old Testament story I wanted to share with you this morning. I had Keith read it before we got on the air here. And I said, what in the world does that have to do with Easter? Keith read from 1 Samuel 5, 1 through 5. And it was that time that the Philistines had they'd carried off, they'd conquered, they'd beaten Israel in a battle. And they'd, they'd captured their ark. And they carried the ark, which was uh, symbolic of the presence of God. And they brought it back to their capital in the, in the Philistines. And here was this big temple. It was the temple of Dagon. He was the first mermaid. <laughs> he wasn't a little mermaid. He was a big merman. He had the, the bottom of him looked like a fish. And the, the upper part of him looked like a man. And he, they called him their, their god of their harvest. He was a green god, an agricultural god. So they said, now we've captured this thing that was so important to them followers of uh, who we would call God. I don't know what the Philistines call them. <laughs> but they thought they had their God because they had that box, which we call the Holy Ark of the Covenant. And they said, what are we going to do with it? Now we've captured and we've got it. It says, well, it's supposed to be a holy object. Let's put it right in there with beside old Dagon in that temple of his. And they put that in there one day and somebody went in there the next morning, probably them priests of Dagon. They said, oh my goodness, that's never happened before. Old Dagon's statue has fell flat on his face. And they had to get a crew out there and get him all set back up and everything. And then they, they thought they had him fixed and got him secured real, real well. And it, I always thought, his, I don't know where they put the Ark of the Covenant, but I thought it's probably over here and old Dagon's fell on his face before it. <laughs> Amen. And they said, oh, Dagon, back up. And they come in the next morning. They said, I'm glad we had that took care of this talk and everything. Couldn't believe that happened. They looked and old Dagon fell on his face again. 
And this time he's busted. <laughs> Only the stump of Dagon was left. And I had Keith read that. I said, what's that got to do with Easter? I'm not good at math, but they put him in there one day. They went back in there the next day. And he fell over and they put him back up. They went back in there on the third day. And he was destroyed. <laughs> Now, what does that have to do with Easter? Because on the third day, Jesus had went right into the very depths and the heart of the darkness and sins of this world and destroyed death, hell, and the grave, and the devil. Amen. And that's why Easter has so much to do with Passover because the Passover to the Jews that was their way out of Egypt where they'd been in bondage all these years and what did the death and resurrection of Christ do but said people you're set free you don't have to remain under the bondage of sin the bondage of death the, the bondage of hell the bondage of the grave because in Christ he set us free have you applied the blood? Based on the word of God, have you said, I believe that gospel story and that Jesus died for me. You know what happens? The blood's applied. And when the judgment comes, God says, I'll pass over you because Christ represented you. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for these few little Old Testament stories and as we get more familiar with the Old Testament, it's so exciting to read the New Testament and see all the allusions back to it. Christ the first fruits, Paul called him. We thank you for this special day, the resurrection day. As Paul also said in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, if there be no resurrection, then our faith is in vain and we are of all men most miserable. But Lord, we thank you that the resurrection's true and that millions and millions of Christians throughout the ages and around the globe today can testify to the truth of the resurrection through the Holy Spirit dwelling in their hearts by faith. So in Jesus' name we give this Christian invitation today. Amen.